so now we are entering into rule number five. Uh, we already have now the foundations laid of the two directions that the soul is moving to. Uh, rule one, the soul that's moving from bad to worse. Uh, rule number two, the soul that's moving from good to better. And then, of course, we have the two different movements of the spirit. Consolations, rule three. Desolations, uh, rule number four. And so now that we have kind of the playing field laid out, we can start to go down and look at some of the concretes and how to navigate um, the spiritual consolations and desolations as they hit the soul. So rule five, if we were to kind of summarize it, it's really about fidelity. So how does the, sto the soul remain faithful to what God has asked it, especially in times of consolation? Because what the enemy wants to do is in times of desolation, basically rattle and shake the soul to the point where it gives up its spiritual kind of resolve. So I'm going to read Rule 5 in its entirety. Uh, Ignatius pulls out some of the big words, uh, and it can be a lot of kind of complicated lingo. I, I will be using a lot of analogies, examples, and stories um, to kind of help break it apart. And, and so hopefully it'll start to illuminate this profound wisdom um, of the church. I've used Rule 5 so many times in my life um, to really thwart uh, what could have been some really bad decisions. So I hope you find it fruitful as well. So rule five states this, the fifth, in time of desolation, never make a change, but be firm and constant in the proposals and determination in which one was the day preceding such desolation, or in the determination in which one was in the preceding consolation. Because as in consolation, the good spirit guides, so in desolation, the bad spirit, with whose counsel we cannot find the way to a right decision. Now, just think about the last time that you experienced either a non-spiritual or a spiritual type of desolation. And oftentimes what happens to us when we are feeling kind of desolate and just distant, uh, not connected, we want to quick make a change. And so we want the dryness, the discouraging stops, the, the discouraging thoughts, the farness from God to stop as soon as possible. That we're willing to change just about anything to make it go away. Now, this is a very human thing. In fact, it's called the pleasure pain principle. Uh, actually, I, I should recant that. It's not just a human thing, it's an animal thing. And so even with irrational beasts and beings in this world, they operate on a pleasure pain principle. Uh, you'll even see this when you're looking at little amoebas and you do something painful and they kind of shrink back. Uh, creatures move towards pleasurable things and they avoid what is painful. Th this is a survival technique that species have learned. Um, if something's hot, move away from it, you're going to get burned. If something's sharp, don't push in on it or you're going to get punctured. If something tastes poor, um, not just because of bad cooking, but like poisonous, spit it out so that you don't die. The pleasure-pain principle has really served creatures uh, throughout history to survive as a species. The problem is, is it doesn't work on the rational or the will level of the creature. It actually is the lower passions. Um, and so this is why, as we talked about in the earlier rules, the enemy loves to move around in these lower passions. It's whenever we start to use right reason, the things start to kind of say, you know, is that is that a good idea or a bad idea? Yeah, I, I know it's hard, but it's worth going through. The enemy doesn't work on the higher playing field. He always tries to move us to base level things. So if we're making decisions in our life based on the pleasure pain principle, we have to kind of pause because we're really making decisions based off of our animal nature, not off of our human nature. So let me give a couple of examples on how sometimes the pleasure pain principle actually gives us bad information to use when making a decision. Now, now the classic example that's oftentimes used with something that's painful, but it produces good fruit, is a mother who's in labor, all right? There, there is no spinal tap, uh, there's no drugs, the mom's just going all natural birth, and it is painful. Uh, I asked one of my uh, dear friends, uh, she had her seventh baby. I said, what's what's it like to give an all-natural birth? Like, give me like kind of a pain level threshold. She's like, um, 
it's kind of like passing a pineapple. Uh, so if you can imagine that, um, that's probably the pain level that these women are going through with a natural childbirth. So right during this, um, this is usually where, you know, a woman will say, I don't know if I can do this again. This is so hard. Um, maybe they'll even blame uh, the doctors or the nurses or their husband um, or just, I can't believe I'm having more children. Why did you do this to me? Because it's just so much pain, right? We just want it to be over with. And so we're not really engaged at this point on the rational level is we're kind of just moving to pay the, 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 the base levels of, I just got to get this pain done. However, once the pain has subsided and the child is given life, it's like the pain doesn't even matter. It's just gone. And so the pain is worth enduring because of what fruitfulness it brings forth. Now, now here's a more universal example of this. Um, during finals week when we're in school, all right, is it's a painful time, right? We've had the whole semester studying. We're exhausted with classes, exhausted with studying. It's the end of the semester. Like, you just want to hang out with your friends. Um, you want to go out for meals. You want to binge shows like Netflix shows. You want to play video game tournaments. Uh, play outside if it's nice in the spring semester, and yet you got to sit down and study so you don't fail your classes or write papers. It's good to endure the pain of studying so that you get the pleasure <laughs> of a good grade. Whereas if you just do what's pleasurable and just kind of squander your last time in, uh, in studies, um, rather than actually studying just to enjoyment, you're going to get a poor grade and probably fail the course. And so it's worth doing and enduring the pain so that you get the good result. Now, in 12-step programs, um, Bill W., who founded AA, or Alcoholics Anonymous, he has this line that I found to be um, just so rich with value. This is the adage that he created. He says, pain is the price of admission to a new life. Pain is the price of admission to a new life. Now, for the addict, right, this makes a lot of sense because they have to endure all the pains of withdrawal, recreating their own life, apologizing to those who they hurt in the midst of their addiction. And so they're realizing, yeah, if I want a ticket to new life, I've got to pay with some pain. And so pain sometimes, right, is worth enduring because of what it brings forth. Now, just as a tangent in this, right, um, I think that it's fair, when we're, when we're looking at this, this Rule 5, we're talking about spiritual desolations, not physical desolations. This isn't like life is hard and everything's going down the tube. This is saying I feel far and distant from God, all right? There are times in our life where pain actually gives us um, really important information to make a decision off of, right? So let, let's just say, and I think all of us have made this mistake at one point or another, we tell a friend, hey, if you ever need help moving, just give me a call. I'll totally be there. Or, if, hey, if you ever need help kind of painting an area of your house or remodeling or doing some garage work, doing putting up a deck, totally there for you. No worries. And then the day comes where they call and they say, hey, I'm calling on that favor. And they're like, no, why did I say that? <laughs> All right. This is one of those times where sometimes we have to actually evaluate. So let's say in a scenario. You have a young family. The kids have been sick, all right? You've been taking care of the kids, and then you get what I've heard is, you know, probably the worst is the sick husband as well. And now they're finally recovered. You're worn down from taking care of them. And now you're starting to feel like you're coming down with it. So you're exhausted. You're behind the times. All of the kind of domestic stuff is, is way behind. You're behind on works. You've taken time off to take care of the family. And... Now the friend calls and says, hey, you want to help me move? Now, now typically, right, in, in Rule 5, it says, when you're in times of desolation, don't make a change. But in regards to natural desolation, or just like hardships in life, sometimes it's the pain of the present that helps us to make a good decision. And this actually relies heavily on the virtue of what is called prudence. It's the governing virtue of all of the different virtues. It tells us how much or how little to do of Something, if something is a good or bad choice, it, it literally weighs every decision. So there are some times where the pain of the present actually gives us important information to say yes or no to decisions that we may have already resolved to make in the past because of what's going on in the present. This is, again, just on the physical level. And prudence, right, is a physical virtue as well. Um, 
as a side tangent and advertisement in the comments section uh, down below. If you want me to do um, some podcast or some uh, YouTube videos on the uh, virtues, uh, prudence, justice, temperance, fortitude, uh, faith, hope, love, uh, happy to do those. Uh, love talking on the virtues uh, as well. It would be a nice break from the rules of discernment for me. Um, but again, going back to this whole pleasure pain, we just want to focus on Ignatius's spiritual principles. So going back again to this text of the fifth rule, uh, let's refocus from this tangent. In the spiritual life, it is meant to happen that we ebb and flow between consolations and desolations. It's meant to just kind of work just like an ocean going. And there'll be times where there's lows, times where there's highs, and you just got to keep moving forward because eventually it will change. In times of consolation, we are always flooded with an intimacy with God, and we begin to make resolutions and decisions of how to grow closer to him and to serve him better. When the tides of desolation come in, these initial decisions lose their hold over us and we begin to want to throw everything overboard because the seas are getting rocky. Now, just think back to like a Lenten resolution, say a Lenten resolution you made in COVID time, <laughs> where you're, you know, oh, Lent's going great, Lent's going great, and then you have to basically give up everything. Yeah, what did you give up for Lent? Oh, life. Um, that's what COVID asked me to give up. And so our initial, right, the zeal and desire to like, you know, fast and do all these sort of pious practices, they just got totally thwarted. And as we're feeling the difficulty of Lent go on, oftentimes we can see, you know, we're like super high on like, yeah, I got this, you know, Lent this is going to be a great Lent. And we get to the end and we're like just crawling, trying to get to the finish line of Easter without breaking all of our resolutions we made for Lent. Um, desolations make it really hard to carry through in um, the spiritual resolutions that we made in consolations. But the answer is not to give up. Uh, rule five literally says this. In times of desolation, and, and Ignatius is not parceling words here, he says, never, never make a change. But be firm and constant in the proposals and determinations in which one was the day preceding such desolations or determinations in which one was in the preceding consolation. This means that it is never a good idea to change one's revolution when, resolution when they feel far from God. Now, if we just look at the scriptures, we see this battle constantly in the book of Exodus and Deuteronomy, where the Israelites, right, they have this initial consolation. God is with us. He's chosen us. He's leading us out um, into the promised land. They get out into the desert, like literally even like in the first couple days, they get to the Red Sea and they're telling Moses, why don't you just let us die in Egypt? And most like, okay, fine, you know, we'll part the Red Sea. They go over in the Red Sea and they're like, yay, we won. And then within like days again, boom, they're complaining. There's no water. There's no food. Why didn't you just leave us in Egypt? Everything was so much better. So what we see with the Israelites, right, is every time desolation hits, pff, all of the initial resolutions they made are just disappearing. And Moses, right, this is the spiritual authority in this, and he's constantly trying to bring the Israelites back to the initial resolution they made. Do you remember? God has chosen you as his people. Do you remember he has a plan for you? Do you remember he loves you? Do you remember he's leading you? Do you remember you can trust him? He does miraculous signs and wonders. So what Moses is always doing when the Israelites are in that spiritual desolation is to remind them of the resolutions they made during the times of consolation. Going against our initial decision when we are not in consolation usually results in even greater harm than we initially had. So again, using the Exodus story, this is great. The Israelites already received food, already received like manna from heaven, quail that came and you know blanketed the camp, and to the point where Moses is like, you'll eat quail until it comes out of your nose, all right? And they got water from the rock, all right? They got, they got everything they need, all right? And then they keep bickering and complaining. So God sends these seraphs that bite the Israelites. And what happens is it killed almost half of the tribe of Israel. And then as they continue to grumble, if you ever want to Google something interesting, look at the trail that the Israelites took from Egypt to the promised land. It literally kind of just goes like this and winds all over the place. They like backtrack several times. And part of it was because they kept complaining. 
So the time of purification extended. The same thing actually happens. Anytime a soul is experiencing desolation, it's actually a time of purification of the soul. And the more that we rebel and try to choose pleasures rather than endure the pain, it prolongs the purification that the Lord wants to actually do. So again, going back to kind of the addiction thing, right? It's the person who's experiencing the pains of withdrawals and it's so painful that they just go back to the substance. And oftentimes, right, the second time they go back, it gets even more intense and it gets even harder to pull away. So by not enduring the desolations and making no resolve, I'm sorry, making no change, it oftentimes does make the process a lot more difficult. Running from resolutions that we made in consolations, it's just, it's not a good idea. If we stand strong and resist the change, God will carry us through it and into his promised land of consolation. Um, if you want to pause this video, I'd encourage you to get a piece of paper and a pen and write down Exodus 14.14. 14. It's one of my all-time favorite passages from the Old Testament, Exodus 14.14. 14. And it, hopefully it'll be like, it's this consolation to say, yep, even in the midst of trial, the Israelites are going through a lot of difficulty. And God is saying, I'll fight for you. Just stay strong. And he says the same thing to us in times of desolation. Yes, it's hard. I know it's hard. But stay strong. It's not going to last forever. Now, there's an example of this reality, actually, that St. Ignatius gives us in his own life. St. Ignatius recounts how he had this resolution, okay, I'm going to take some time for prayer. And then he sits down to pray, and he begins to, you know, go through his mind, what is the best posture to pray in? Should I be kneeling? Should I be sitting? Should I be lying prostrate on the ground? Um, should I be interceding in cruciform pattern? How should I be praying before God? And he keeps, he's just restless. Like, how is my prayer supposed to be for God? How am I going to use this time? To the point where then, by the time that his prayer time is done, he's done no praying. And Ignatius, right, all that his prior resolution was is, I'm just going to go pray. But he spent the entire time in distractions. This example is perfect in illuminating what happens if we allow desolation to decide for us what we are going to do in our spiritual life. Uh, one of the adages that calls this actually is listlessness, or as the first rules of Ignatius talks about, it's a disturbance of peace, the classic sign of de desolation. We move from one thing to the next, trying to avoid the dryness, and we end up accomplishing nothing. But if we were to just stick to our prior proposal, even in the midst of pain, yeah, it would hurt a little bit, but eventually it would give way and break. So I can't tell you how many times in the chapel, this is kind of my mindset, right? Oh, shoot, I've got to call so-and-so, or I've got to respond to that text, or shoot, I didn't post on Instagram today to keep my people updated, um, I've got to respond to this email. I'll, I'll just I'll just pull up my smartphone and do it quick. Or I've got to prepare this homily or talk. Or oh no, I forgot to mention that. I forgot to call back that person. And then it gets to the end of my prayer time, and I haven't made any times of prayer. I've just done a lot of thinking. And so as I failed to adhere to my spiritual resolution that I made in consolation to take time of prayer, so I go into prayer and then boom, I just feel more and more desolate. So I leave prayer after kind of using my prayer time to think, right? And I feel really, really good as soon as I leave prayer. I'm like, yeah, all right, we're ready to go for the day. I got all my stuff done, got it all prioritized. But within 20 minutes of leaving prayer, I'm left completely empty. Whereas if I would have just said, okay, guardian angel, I need to remember these things. <laughs> I need you to remind me to call so-and-so or to write back this email. I have to use this time for prayer. When I leave that time of prayer, even though I got no practical things done, I will feel so much peace that will carry me through the day, despite my fluttery mind that's trying to get attention. Or as Teresa of Avila says, the mind is a screaming idiot who wants you to pay attention to him. But if I do allow myself to be distracted during prayer, it's not uncommon that I'll enter then the thralls of self-pity, right? Is so once the 20 minutes of the high that I got things done ends, I'm then like, oh, I can't do this, and prayer's not helpful and fruitful, and I don't even know if I'm using this right. I should just give up. And then we start to break more and more spiritual resolutions because of desolation. We're making changes in times of desolation. Had I just in the midst of this turned against the desolation and prayed for it to break, Rather than entertaining a million and one alternative suggestions, the desolation would have lifted and I would have had a, an abundance of consolation visit the soul. 
Often this is indeed the case. If we just resist a little bit longer than we wanted to, we'll feel the desolation break. The evil one knows this to be true, and so he tries to thwart us right before a breakthrough is about to happen. I cannot tell you how many times in my ministry where right before a profound spiritual encounter happens, the enemy is just knocking at my door trying to dissuade me or discourage me. Um, where I'll have to be given a talk at some parish or doing some event. And I'll be like, oh, why, why did I commit to this? Why did I do this? This is so dumb. Like, and I'm just, I'm just feeling all of this exhaustion and burden. And I want to just like call at the last minute and be like, you know what? I can't do it. I'm sorry. And yet when I push through and I adhere to the spiritual, the decision I made in spiritual consolation, it's an incredible fruitfulness that erupts forth because I persevered. It literally is the case that we cannot even entertain changing anything spiritual when we're experiencing desolation. Because again, Ignatius is not mincing words. He uses the word never make a change in times of desolation. The enemy speaks often in absolutes. He does this to threaten us, which is all the more discouraging as he presents realities that are very one-sided. And when we bite onto those lures and they hook us, it's really painful. Like he'll say things like, oh, you're always doing it wrong, or you can never figure it out, or God has not chosen you. Again, the enemy isn't using our reason. He's using our passions and desolation, that feeling of being far from God. And so in the midst of that farness from God, he'll use these absolutes to make us even more discouraged to say, okay, you're right, I can't do it. I'm just going to give up. That's not how God speaks. Uh, God says to those who are struggling, hey, with me, all things are possible. You can do this. You got this with my grace. If we just took one moment to actually think through these things rather than allow our passions to rage, oftentimes we would make it through desolation periods a lot more efficiently and effectively. Now, the last line in Rule 5 is also meant to assist us in understanding the evil one's tactics. Ignatius says, when we are in desolation, it is the evil one that is trying to guide and counsel us counsel which will never lead us to the correct decision. Now, here are some of the evil one's counsels during times of desolation. I am not meant for a deep prayer life. I should postpone my resolution to go and pray. I need to rediscern decisions that I once thought were solid. Now, these are things that the enemy will propose, right? And he's encouraging us to think like he thinks. But again, I mean, if you were to ask someone, hey, do you want to take counsel from the enemy? You'd be like, no, of course not. But when we're in desolation and we're listening to these proposals, guess who we're dialoguing with? We're literally dialoguing with the devil at this point. As it's not God who is counseling us at points of discouragement and desolation to give up. It was not God who, when Christ was in the garden, saying, my God, my God, will you please remove this chalice from me? It was the enemy who said, yeah, just, just give up. You've done enough. It was the Lord who says, no, you got this. You got this. Son, I know this is going to be hard, but you got this. Persevere through and it's all worth the resurrection. Now, to use an analogy, and this is one that was given to me on a retreat that I absolutely loved. Um, when I was a kid, I was oftentimes the kid that would go into a store with my mom and I would get lost because I would just kind of look at a shiny object. Um, totally got like the ADHD kind of thing going all over the place. And so I would be in the store. I would beeline for something. My mom would be shopping. She would turn around, couldn't find me. I couldn't find her and I would freak out. Now, what would initially happen, right, is then I would start to go look for my mom, which would mean I would get even more lost <laughs> because she's looking for me and I'm looking for her and we're going in opposite directions. Whereas if I were to just stop where I am and sit down, eventually I would get found. The same thing is true in times of desolation. In desolation, right, the enemy wants to move us to all these sorts of things. What about this? What about this? What about this? And so we start moving on all these tangents and we get really restless and disturbed. Whereas if we're just saying, okay, I'm really feeling desolate and far from God. God, I need you to find me right now. And we just wait it out. The desolation oftentimes will break. Uh, just like a bad storm that comes, it can't last forever. Eventually, the storm will pass and good weather will come. Now, rule six that follows after rule five, obviously, numerically, um, 
it's it's actually really beautiful how it does and i, I don't want to spoil the rule but it, it dovetails beautifully with this line from ignatius of never make a change when you're in desolation is it's the complementary to this so stay tuned uh for rule number six which uh Please, God, and your prayers uh, will be released sometime by this weekend. Uh, God bless and have a wonderful uh, day.